friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. Got a little different video for you today. I get lots and lots of inquiries on the different tools and fixtures and specialty tools and things like that all the time. People are saying, where did you get that? How did you, how did you make that, etc. and so forth. You know, I got to thinking a video just on that subject would be a good idea. Then I got to thinking, Wow, this is going to be a long video. <laughs> I would suggest you go get your favorite beverage, get in your easy chair, and lean back if you're really interested in this because it's this will probably be a long video. I've already got probably 25 or 30 things laying here in front of me, and I haven't even got good and started yet. So the video is going to cover tools, miscellaneous fixtures, machines that I've built, anything that I use in my luthier trade to uh, get the job done. I don't even know where to start, so let's just start with something simple. This is just coat hanger wire. That's all it is. You can see I have bent hooks on each end. You can do this any number of ways. Could have made it look different. I just bent those hooks on there so they could catch the string ball for the two E strings on a guitar. So you hang this on the tail pan. You have to put some leather or some kind of padding. Sometimes you even need to put padding on the back side and on this side. And you put that on the guitar. Then you can put these the two strings on there. This is just soldered together, by the way. And you can put the two strings on there then and then float your bridge and keep floating it around until you get the intonation just right. And, you know, so this is a very handy fixture. I'm sure you've seen me use it dozens of times. I use it a lot whenever I'm, especially if I'm doing a new bridge. Or even a new guitar. You know, a guitar I make myself, I would use this to set the bridge in the right place rather than just go by measurement. This gives you the, the right place, trust me, compared to measurements. Sometimes measurements don't work. So there you go. That's the first one. Dozens more. <laughs> this is a C-clamp. You can see I took a piece of pipe, cut a piece of pipe off, and just welded it to the bottom lip of the C-clamp. I put, this is leather lined in here. I first just had this flat bar steel, but that doesn't work as well. I put this, I welded this square onto it. Now I can turn it in any direction in my vise. That makes it much more convenient, by the way. So my vise holds it like this. That also stiffened it up, so it's real stiff now. And you can put the mandolin neck in here. This would be, of course, the round side of the mandolin neck down. But if I need to turn the round side up for whatever reason, maybe I'm doing binding on the back of the instrument or whatever. So I just use this. I just put this little flat block, uh, this little half round block in there. And now I can lay the flat part of the fretboard on here and put some padding under here and, and clamp it down upside down. So this is a very handy tool for working on mandolins. You could probably even adapt this for a guitar. Um, I don't think it would be a problem to use it on a guitar. You're only catching it in one point, you have to understand, so you can't put a lot of pressure on the instrument anywhere. And the same goes for a mandolin. You can't really put a lot of pressure on it, but, but it's very handy. It kind of gives you that third hand uh, to hold the instrument while you're working on some particular detail. So this is a very handy clamp right here. I use it all the time. I didn't make these planes at all, but you see me use them all the time. So I just thought I'd show them quickly because I want to show you what I do with the blades that are in them. Um, you know, I have one here that I just keep the regular uh, smooth round blade in. And then this one has the toothed blade. Hopefully you can see the difference there. Try to hold them both up at the same time and maybe you can see the difference. They come with two blades, They come, or, well at least or I bought them that way, I don't know which way, but anyway, so I had extra uh, smooth blade. Well I put that in this holder. You see me use this a lot in cleaning out the bridge area where the bridge goes on the guitar. This 
you know, with having this bevel under here, you can get down pretty low, lift the finish up. Um, you can use it as a scraper and, and chisel. Yeah, and the reason I like it is because it does have the round chisel. And you could use a regular square chisel, but the problem is the corners are always digging in. This doesn't dig in like that. So this to me is very handy to be used as a little spare chisel. I just cut a slot in a piece of aluminum there and then put a set screw in. That's all I did. Simple, and, but I use it a lot. And it's, it's a handy tool. Sure, I could make a better version of this or something, but this just happened to be in the scrap bin one day, this piece of aluminum, and I had this, and I had the idea, and I did it, and I use it all the time. So it's handy for me. May not work for you that great, but I like it a lot. <sighs> this is a very simple tool. This is just like an ice pick. I don't even remember where I got these points, but I got the points somewhere. Maybe they were just in something I bought at an auction. I don't know. But uh, I just sharpened the point up really sharp. Just put a handle on it. Very good for marking holes, especially for the uh, tuning keys and things like that when you've got to drill a bunch of holes to mount the tuning keys. You know, you, you always need some sort of an awl, awl A-W-L. <laughs> and uh, this is what I use. I thought this was interesting. This was one Chuck sent to me. It's a little tiny saw. And you can probably see there that he I think he took a jigsaw blade and stuck it in there. I already had my own version of it. And what I did was I made mine out of a hacksaw blade. Mine's got a little finer teeth. What do you use saws like this for? Well, I don't know what Chuck used his for, but I use mine to go down inside the bridge pin holes and make that little groove in the bridge pin hole. And you can just take this and work it up and down and make that little groove. And I just took a, a, a hacksaw blade, sawed it off, put it, you know, and then just clamped it in here in this handle. I've been using it for, I couldn't tell you how many years. Use it quite often. Uh, you know, I don't use it that often, but I mean, it, it really depends on the instrument. If you just need a little bit more clearance, this is the thing that can give you that little bit more clearance of, for your string. I think Stu Max sells these. You know, I, for years, well, my fingers have always been very strong, and I never really felt like I needed a handle. I, for years, I just used a six inch flat file for leveling frets, just turned the tang up so I always knew which side went down. The tang going up would obviously, you know, make you have to use it only one way. But, you know, I saw Randy Schardiger using one of these, and I think he got it from Stumac. So I thought, you know, why not? So I just took a piece of maple, made myself a handle, and then I either epoxied it or, or uh, CA glued it. I can't remember. Probably CA glue because I don't do too much with epoxy. And anyway, I just mounted the handle to it. And I've been using this for four or five years now. Works great. You know, on soft frets, these files will last a long time. I will tell you there's something about, a lot of, about files that a lot of people don't know. And that's pretty much that you don't ever find a completely flat file. If you've got a very good eye, you can look down your file and there will almost always be a little slight hump. And I mean it's very slight, but you want that hump, you want the convex side down and the concave side up. So in other words, you want it like that. You lay that down on that and then you glue it like that to your, to your uh, block. But anyway, that's just a six inch mill bastard file. Uh, it's a Nicholson file. And I cut the tang off, as you can see there, and just glued it to this. Works great for leveling frets. And, and the handle just makes it that much better. I really do like the addition of the handle. This, for me, is a super, super, super handy tool. And you can buy things like this, but I don't think they work as good as this. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a dowel turned down on the end to fit my drill. I cut a slot through it, as you can see. So what do I use this for? Tuning upright bases, or anything with really large tuning keys. You can put this on there, and then the slot there it will slide down over the key better, and then you can line it up with your you know, key and your drill, and then you can go either direction with it. 
they put the screw through there to keep the, because apparently, you know, the, the grain went through here and it split it one time. So I see I glued it back together, put a uh, screw through there and tightened it down. I've never had any more trouble with it. I've used it for years. It's an incredibly handy tool, especially for upright bases. These are all just, obviously, just things I've made in the shop here. This go, falls under the category of a modified tool. This is just a standard nut driver. It's one that fits a lot of, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot. This one actually doesn't fit that many, but it does fit certain uh, truss rods. But the problem a lot of times is the outside of this is too big to fit in there. You know, this will fit the nut, but the outside then is too big around and it doesn't go down in the hole very good. So I just simply took it to the sander and just sanded it you know, thinner, so it's a much thinner deal. Now, that should still be plenty strong for most truss rod adjustments. If you're ha if it's gonna break that out, you're probably putting too much torque on your truss rod anyway. So, anyway, it works, that works great. And I had, I actually modified several of my nut drivers that way and just, you know, sanded the outside of them down. Well, we still got quite a few here and we haven't even got started good yet. <laughs> This was just a pallet knife, an artist pallet knife. I cut it off shorter because I wanted it to be stiffer. I sharpened it to a razor edge here. Right now it's got glue all over it. So you always have to heat these up and get the glue off or whatever. But, uh, and, and I also beveled this back here so that this can go under a bridge really easy. You know, there's the wider ones, a lot of people think that's the way to go. I, see, I'm always of the opinion that the smaller you go, the better, most, most of the time on instruments. And the reason is, it takes less force. You know, if you get a big wide thing, you got to push really hard. You get this little narrow thing, you don't have to push very hard. You know, or not nearly as hard. I mean, you, know, you still got to do some pushing, don't get me wrong. But anyway, so that, and then that, that's a really stiff blade too, which is very important. You get a real flexible blade, you'll bend them all the time. I've got several of them I've bent. But this one was a, just an artist palette knife as far as I can remember. And I just shortened it up real good. And you know, put a, I tried to put a slight bend in it. So, and then I also beveled off the bottom of it there. So, you know, I only use it one direction. This, it's always turned this direction pretty much when I use it. And uh, you can heat this up on your iron or whatever and get it good and hot and slide it under there. Works really good. So that's, that's a real indispensable tool right there. I use that a lot. Here's the bigger version of it. Um, you know, I made this one too, just a walnut piece there. Put a this was a um, putty knife. And um, on this one, I actually don't have it sharp. I just, it's a real thin bladed putty knife. These are very good though. They're, they're stiff, flexible, and you know, like maybe if I get something started, I can slide this in there. Sometimes I just use this as a placeholder, just kind of hold it in there. But I mean, I do use this to take things apart as well. So I've got, these two are the ones I use the most. Chuck sent me a couple too, and I do use those occasionally. Here's a specialty saw I made, and it's, you know, the shape of this has got nothing to do with anything. It, this is the shape it's in at the moment. I might bend it to a totally different shape when I need to saw something internally in a guitar. You, I, I just, this is probably off of a fret saw, something like that. It's just a blade, a little piece of a blade. I turned it so that when you're, you're pulling is when you're cutting. I turned the teeth so that this is a pull saw, because Inside something, it's hard to push, but you can get it up against something and pull, and then put it up against something and pull, put it up against something and pull, and you can saw something off inside of an instrument this way. So it's very handy. I don't use it very often, but whenever you need it, you need it. So again, I just soldered this to a stiff piece of wire. This is like number nine iron wire type wire. I mean, it's just heavy wire. I don't know what, what it really is. But uh, the shape of it doesn't really matter because you're going to bend it in the shape you need at the time. And, uh, you know, it, you can see that it, it, it's for made for going down through the sound hole and being inside there and sawing something off. I'm sure most of these things you've seen in videos, so I just don't remember which video <laughs> is the problem. This is a uh, clamp or an inside, you know, post thing that I made. 
Um, it's just a turnbuckle and I put some plastic on the ends and it's okay. It's just not one of my favorite kind of jacks. It's, it looks like it should work great and it would if you could get to it. See, like if, if, if your guitar was made like this where you could just stick this inside your guitar, no problem. But when you got to go down through a sound hole and then, then manipulating this is not that easy because you don't have anything to hold it here. You know, it, it's just not that easy. Sometimes they're handy, especially if it's close to the sound hole, but overall this is not that great of an option. But I just wanted to show it to you, you know, because people all the time ask me, why don't you use a turnbuckle with it? You know, whatever. Well, there it is, but I don't think it's that great. This is a little better option than that, although it's not the best either. This would be better if it was a better made clamp. The, you know, this is a uh, Harbor Freight deal. And you squeeze it like this and it and it spreads out but see i can hold it right there and it it just with my fingers and it won't lift my fingers it's just not strong enough this is not a bad option in a lot of times the problem is you got this thing sticking out and it can't be sticking out really above this unless you're actually on a tall brace if you're on a tall brace well then you got a little bit of room here but uh anyway this this does work pretty well um it's probably second best clamp for internal that I have. Uh, it's just that it doesn't have enough strength. Um, you know, I, I'm i sure they make better ones than this. These were the Harbor Freight ones and they're, they were cheap, so I just bought them and used them. Um, they're still handy, but I pro if I find some really good strong ones of these, I would probably buy them and, and remake these because they are kind of handy. This comes in the form of a modified tool again. This is those rubber deals. Let me get one to show you what they look like. They come like this. Uh, one of my viewers sent these to me. I don't remember who was. Was it? I don't remember if it was Colin or someone else. But this, this falls in the category of tools I didn't know I needed, really. Um, but these are very handy. These are just for holding sandpaper. You can wrap your sandpaper around them, get a grip on your sandpaper. This, this is your round side. This is your... Uh, you know, internal round side, or like if you wanted to sand a dowel, this would be the side you would use to sand a dowel. This side here would be to sand some internal curve or whatever. Well, I, you know, these are kind of big, actually. I, again, small for me is always better because you're doing super detail work. And so I just cut this one off at an angle. I can reach up under a lip, like right next to a, you know, a raised fretboard on a mandolin, for instance, and it'll go under there a little bit further and I can put my sandpaper on it. I also sanded it flat on, on this spot here. Now, the other half of this, I left it like it was, and I use it like it was, but, but to me, having them small like this is far better. You can just get into the detail, and they really work great. These are really handy. So whoever did send them to me, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I use them all the time. This next one is not anything fancy, but it's just one of those necessary evils. You're always needing hooks and things to hang things with. So this is a very stiff piece of wire again. I've got a hook on it. I can hang it on a nail. Then I've got a larger hook here, or I, you know, that's just the way I made this one. Typically, I just bend the wire in a bigger hook, but you got to be careful with wire. You don't want it something that's going to straighten out. This will really hold a lot of weight. Um, this, this is a very strong piece of wire and that extra little hook there. Then you can hook something fairly big on there and hang it. I've got lots of versions of this. This is just the one I picked up, but uh, there's tons of hangers like this around in the shop and they're very handy. So you just need uh, these little hangers all the time. At least I do. And speaking of hanging things, these are also two more hanger deals that I have. And these are just large loops. And you can see that I have a screw going through there, I think. I know the camera's probably not focusing all the time. But that's just a screw. And all I did was just take and uh, take a coat hanger, bend it around, and then make two loops on it, put the screw down through there. And then I think I soldered the two loops together so that they couldn't come apart. So anyway, it's real solid. Same way with this one, it's just a little bigger version. And you know, like you can screw this in where the end pin goes in a guitar or mandolin or whatever, and then hang it up. And it's, you know, it's really solid that way. So, you know, I use those a lot, especially on mandolins. I use them tons on mandolins. This is another little internal clamp that I think you saw me use once. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's a specialty tool. You only use it once in a while, but it's really handy. And it's just, it's, it's just a, a slide. This piece here slides inside of this little half pipe there that I, I sawed off and it, it stays in the pipe. I just put two 22 shell casing bullets here. Uh, it's just the, the empty case. And that's just to spread out the stress so that it's flat and pushing against the wood. And then you can just, this obviously is for reaching through a sound hole. Uh, and, and you know, you can only go in a little tiny ways with this. Uh, you know, like maybe through an F hole of a violin and you need to lift it up for some reason. Well, this will, you can tighten the screw down and it'll lift it right up. This piece here is one continuous threaded rod. This piece right here, one continuous threaded rod, just slid into the end of this. This piece is soldered in down here, so it just slides in there like so. This is just a bushing or a spacer or whatever that sits on top of this, so it, that's, you have to have something to push against, and that's just there to push against so that the nut can lift this up. That's all it is. It's not very complicated. No, I don't have any kind of measured drawings on any of this, okay? There's no drawings, period. So. Let me get that out right now. <laughs> and I'm not about to make any or tell you any more detail. This is the detail you get right here because I, there's just way too much. Okay, so that's, that's a handy little deal when you need it. You don't need it that often, but when you need it, that's the thing right there. This is another specialty clamp. This thing works like a little champ. Um, let's say you've got a crack that's uneven on the top of your guitar or whatever, something like that. You know, it, it's to close, we'll say it's closed up, but it's uneven for whatever reason. You know, or maybe, <clears throat> maybe even there's a little slight sag there or something. This is a lifting clamp. It lifts. You have to drill a hole through your top. Don't get me wrong. And you think, drill a hole through your top? Well, but you use just like a little tiny wire drill. I mean, like smaller than the end of a toothpick sometimes. And you take a guitar string then and you feed it down through that hole and maybe out through your sound hole and then you tie something flat or big or whatever you need you tie it on the end of there even if it's a brace for instance you could and put your brace through through that wire then you start pulling it back up through the hole then you wind it up on this thing and this sits on the top like like that's the crack or the hole or whatever and you set this on top and then you just start tightening this up and that pulls that wire right up it's awesome when you need this, this thing is killer. And you can really torque down on this puppy. I mean, this thing will put some, you know, before you break your wire, of course, but uh, you can put whatever amount that wire will hold, this thing will definitely pull that much for sure. It's very handy. It's just a little cheapy, um, this, I can't, some of those old violin tuning, you know, machines, that's what this came off of. And you can see how I just made it there. You can make this piece out of wood. I use plastic. You could use almost anything. This hole just has to be more or less centered where, you know, where your wire goes up through this hole and hooks into the uh, post there. Hopefully this is all making sense to you. But anyway, you just tighten it up and pulls that wire right up through your guitar and tightens up your brace or whatever. They're very, very, very handy when you need it. I just thought I'd mention that the specialty tools like this, I will put these at the end of the video. This is a this is that wedge tool that people are always asking me, where did you get that? You know, if this is for measuring the height of your strings off of your frets. So this is for measuring your action, at, especially at the 12th fret. Doesn't work so great at the first fret, but it works really good at the 12th fret. So people are always wanting to know where I got that. We'll talk about any kind of specialty tools like this at the end of the video. All right, this you've seen me use quite a few times. It's a homemade fret bender. You'd probably be better off buying this rather than you know making your own, but I have a machine shop, so I just wanted to make my own. It's a piece of aluminum across the top here and you know, thread it down into this bigger block of aluminum then as you can probably see i've cut out in this part of the aluminum and I'm, i made it like a mortise and tenon this this piece in the middle here slides up and down in the mortise and tenon you take this top part off this piece can just pull right out and it slides down in mortise and tenon wise hopefully you can kind of see the mortise and tenon there on the edges 
And anyway, and so this center wheel, you know, is attached to that this center block, and it just you can go up and down with the center wheel. These two are just fixed. They rotate very easily. They have a little tiny groove in them to help keep the wire front wire centered. I don't know why it's not focusing a little better there, but but th this one has a fairly deep groove in it, so that's where the tang of the front wire goes is it up inside of this deeper groove, and you just and I just run it through by hand. I could put a crank on this one, and I thought about doing that, but it's not even needed. I don't need it at all. I just run it through by hand, and it works perfectly. And once you get it started, you just grab it and pull it through. I don't need any cranks or anything. It works really fine. So this is a really good fret wire bender. Works perfectly for me. I guess actually I should call it a fret wire roller. This next tool is a, it's an action tool for the first fret. It's, it's when you want to be more precise. It does work really well. You can basically do a good job without this by using a feeler gauge or a thin pick. But if you really, really want to get picky, this thing measures in thousands of an inch. And you can set this on the string. This, this plunger here goes up and down. You can see it goes up and down. And, and you can see the dial indicator. And of course, just the slightest movement there, slightest movement moves, that's a bunch of thousands. In other words, you know, each, each one of these individual marks around here, that's 10 thousandths of an inch. 10 thousandths of an inch is about two thicknesses of a human hair put together. So it's very thin. Anyway, this works really well. It does have one big disadvantage. When you set this on your string, there's weight to this plunger. So the weight of that plunger by itself will push your string down just a little bit. And that's why you can't really use it back at the 12th fret because the weight, you know, it's a lot easier to push your string down back there at the 12th fret than it is at the 1st fret. It's a lot harder to push it down at the 1st fret. So this works pretty good at the 1st fret, really doesn't work anywhere else. You do have to kind of know that it's going to put a couple thousandths inches pressure on your string. What you do is you set this on your string and then you go ahead and push your string the rest of the way down and you see how much the dial moves. If the dial moves ten thousandths of an inch, you might realize that it's probably about twelve thousandths of an inch above the fret. Hopefully that makes sense to you because of the weight that this is added to your string. So anyway, it's, it's pretty cool though. It really does give you a very precise way to set the action. This is a machined brass. This is a set screw that holds the barrel there. In other words, you can undo that and then lift this right out. You can just see this is just an indicator. It's got a long barrel there that sticks down through. The set screw tightens up on the barrel. You can turn this in any direction that's convenient for you to be looking at. So it, it's it's an easy design, easy way to make the thing. You know, I think you can buy them from Stumac. They're very expensive. This one cost me next to nothing because you can buy these indicators for under 20 bucks. And I just made the rest of the parts. So you could make this, technically you can make it out of wood. I mean, you could, you could actually make it out of wood. It, it, it doesn't have to be machined all that precisely. It's just how you use it is the preciseness, if that makes any sense to you. Because once you set it down on your fretboard, it isn't going to move. So it doesn't really matter how you machined it, whether you did it with a file or you know, hand files. You can make this with a hand file if you really wanted to. Hopefully that makes sense to you. This is nothing more than just a little block of wood. It's got a little bit of a curved bottom to it. It's kind of a silly thing to show, but I, I stick a, the inside of a ballpoint pen. I just stick it through there. I just use this as a marking deal so I can slide this through that curved top of a mandolin like this. And like I have the uh, brace, maybe the base bar in there, and I just slide this along like this and it marks the line on the base bar. That's all it is. Just very simple, just a hole drilled through a block of wood. An even simpler way, although I don't know if it would work any better, I, I think it would work fine, is just to use a, a thin washer and, and a, with a small hole. And then you just roll, roll the washer along the base bar with this in there and it would work the same. It would work fine. But I just made this, I've been using it for years, it works really good. 
Um, the washer probably would even be more accurate to be perfectly honest with you. This is just a modified tool. It's a cabinet scraper. It's about wore out now. I've, I've sharpened it so many times. The way I do it, most people take scrapers and they block the edge, make it square more or less, and then they, they bevel off both sides of it with a burring tool. They take a, a, uh, a burnishing tool and they rub it down and make the edge flare over on both sides. I do it a little different. I learned it from a violin maker in St. Louis. He sharpened them on one edge, made them razor sharp just like a knife, and then he took that razor sharp edge and curled it over with a burnishing tool. And that's what I do. So mine just has a curl on one side and you can use this as a scraper and you can scrape paint off with it. You can, you know, you can scrape the instrument smooth with it. Like the insides of my mandolins, I don't use sandpaper. I just use the scraper and get it really smooth that way. The outside, I typically do use sandpaper, but I don't care about the outside so much. The reason I don't want to use sandpaper inside the instrument is I don't want to fill those, those open pores with, sand, with uh, sanding dust. So anyway, there you go. That's, that's just a shop modified uh, cabinet scraper is all it is. Just sharpen it on one edge, get it razor, razor sharp, hone it, you know, and then burnish the edge over. And man, you're talking about something that cuts. That really does cut. You can take off a lot of wood very fast with that. All right, the last one in this set of tools, although there's plenty more coming, don't get me wrong, but the last one in this first group of tools that I pulled out was is my thickness uh, gauge. I use this for measuring the thickness of mandolins and uh, you know the tops and the backs as I'm carving them. You could use it for a guitar or anything and I have used it for many many purposes beyond just carving the top and back of a mandolin. But I made this myself. It's just a large block of aluminum. I cut all this out. You could do that on a bandsaw. I I think I machined mine out because I just have the ability to do that. And I, you know, I put a hole through here. There's just a screw going up through here with a round end on the screw, if, if it'll focus on that. It's just, I just rounded the screw off. The plunger then, the round end of the plunger matches that. And this is just a handle to lift up the plunger. That's all it is, it's just, it just rocks right here. Nothing fancy. This is kind of the way the commercial ones are made. I've seen some of the commercial ones. And again, I've just got one of these dial indicators that you can buy for under 20 bucks. Doesn't cost you very much to make it. I made this wooden base and screwed it on through the bottom here. And so that way I can set it down flat on my table. So the way I actually use it is I set it down flat, slide the top, lift this up, slide the top in there, drop it down and measure how thick it is. It measures in thousands of inches again. As I've told you, when I build my mandolins, I measure all that carving in thousands of inches. I have a template of all the different thicknesses. And probably one of my most controversial inside jacks is this one right here. <laughs> it stirred up a lot of crud <laughs> on the internet when I modified a tool that someone sent me. That, you know, David made this tool and sent it to me and said he thought I could get some use out of it. Well, of course, I modified it significantly right off the bat because it wouldn't work for me the way he had made it. He made it for his one-time use special purpose. I think it's the greatest design ever of this little mechanism right here. So I wanted to use his mechanism he made. All I did was I shortened the barrel here. He had a real long barrel on it and a bunch of other stuff attached. I just shortened the barrel here and you know it's a it's this mechanism lifts this uh, pad up and down and what's really cool about this is that the pad doesn't spin. Therefore it doesn't spin off of your brace or spin out of the way. That's one of the biggest problems with these things is when you've got something inside the instrument this wants to spin and it spins away from whatever you're doing. This one doesn't spin. This stays perfectly still and you go up and down with it like this and you can raise up and jack something up inside the guitar. I put this on there so I could reach in through the sound hole and still be able to hold it and reach pretty far back in there and still turn it. But if it's really far back in there, then I got this flexible extension. Now this, this I added this piece on here too. This is just a, uh, I don't know, it's like a nut driver 
type deal. Uh, you can buy these at the hardware store. It just comes in a little kit. I don't even remember what the kit was now, but it has, I think it had a couple of screwdriver blades with it and stuff. So this thing here like just fits little bits like this basically is what it amounts to. Although th this is the square end here, but the other end was this. Well, anyway, I just made that fit where I could press it on here and it, and it stays on there now on that shaft and I can, you know, turn it. That gives me a good grip on it there. Then I can take the square end flexible quarter inch shaft, put it in here, and now I can be outside the sound hole and do the same thing. And this is a one of those little ratchets that just sticks in the end of here. And this is one of those little finger ratchets. And you know, it's got it's actually got ratcheting action there. You can go forwards and backwards with it and it'll, it'll turn it one way or you can flip this around and it'll go the other way. So anyway, that this is just an incredibly handy little tool. Now, sadly, <laughs> I haven't got to hardly use it much. I think I only used it once since I modified it, and it worked great. But uh, this is the cat's meow as far as I'm concerned about internal jacks. So once again, David, thank you very much for sending this to me. It's a very, very nice tool. And this stuff here is just stuff I bought at the hardware store to add to it. Friends, I interrupt this video uh, for two purposes. First, I want to show you a new baby that was born on the farm last night. Just for calendar purposes, today is September 23rd, 2019. And after we take a look at that new baby, I want to uh, show you a couple of gifts that I received from the Netherlands. They're on my uh, son's farm and he's had a new baby born in the uh, corral here this morning and uh, looks like it's got uh, two white back legs and a blaze face. Is it a male or female? It's a boy, a little stud colt. Getting around really good for as little as it is. When was it born? 11 o'clock last night. Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at the uh, new baby, a uh, cute little critter. I received a couple of gifts from the Netherlands, Michael and Elizabeth. So Michael sent me this. It is a banjo lin. Give you a look at it there. I don't see a brand name on it. So I'm not sure who made this one. It uh, is in a world of hurt. Uh, the neck angle, as you can see, is kind of coming down pretty steep like this. So it would need quite a bit of work. The actual rim is folded in. The, in other words, the strings pulled the neck up and folded the rim in is really what I can see is wrong with it. So it would take quite a bit of work to fix it. Don't know if I'll get to that or not. May, you never know, maybe one of these days. And the other thing, and I'm embarrassed to tell you right off the top, I don't know what this is. <laughs> it's not written in English. And I can't read the language that it is written in, which I'm assuming is Dutch or German or something. I'm not really sure. But anyway, that's what it is. You can pause your video there if you want to read some of that. Um, it smells like cinnamon. It's hard as a brick. So I don't think it's something you're supposed to eat. See, I've Googled all these words and I got nothing. 
I, you know, I Googled all of the words that I could make out on here and, or at least many of the words I can make out on here that I thought might give me a clue and I got nothing back that helped me at all with this. And my wife did the same thing. She was Googling it too. And uh, so we don't really know what this is. I, you know, I, I'm guessing anything from literally something you would drop in your coffee to, <laughs> to, you know, to put a cinnamon flavor in your coffee to something you'd put in your drawers to make them smell like uh, cinnamon or maybe even to hang them in a closet to smell like cinnamon. I have no idea what this is, to be perfectly honest with you. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that, but it's the truth. But I do thank you, Michael and Elizabeth, for thinking of me and sending me these little goodies. And who knows, one of these days you may see this critter uh, come back to life and we might do something with it on the channel here. I don't really know what we'll do with it, but thank you very kindly. Now back to the tool video. We're now in the other part of the shop and I want to show you some more tools, jigs, and fixtures that I've made that are helpful for working on instruments. The first thing we're looking at is a dreadnought mold. When you bend your sides, you need some way to kind of keep them in shape. And this mold is exactly the shape of a dreadnought guitar, a Martin style guitar. And I can put them in there and, you know, hold them in place while I glue on the back or the top or whatever the case might be. I will point out that I put these blocks on the up here on this end so that they're the height of the sides because I found that if you only have it down at this level that the sides can actually split right here because of the end grain and they want to, you know the pressure there sometimes can cause it to split so the top half can split well if you have this here then the top is supported and so is the top up here and those are at the right height for the sides these nails around here that you can see are just so that you could take a string and go across and go across and bind the top or the back down to the sides real well. If you've got the top facing up, well then there's an angle to the back, so you'll have to put some sort of a little block under here, a filler block under here to keep the sides level or whatever. But you know, all that stuff's little minor detail-y stuff, but suffice it to say you need some sort of a mold to hold your guitar sides when you're bending them. Here's another mold. This was the first one I made. Now this one is actually a 12 string dreadnought style guitar. So the shoulders are a little more rounded. I had orders to build two 12 string guitars right off the bat when I first started building. And so this was the very first mold I made. This mold right here was the first mandolin mold I made. I made it right out of the Semenoff book. To me it was overly complicated so the second mold I made is this one right here, and that one I just made directly off of a 1924 Lloyd Lore mandolin. You can see there's a set of sides started in there already. Those turnbuckles allow you to move the center part outward and press the sides against the mold. This block is what I use to get the angle to, you know, the, the peg head goes here, the neck goes here on the mandolin, and then I can hold this with some clamps right here, and then I can saw out the profile of that peg head on my band saw. So that's what that's used for. This rack of wooden boards, these are just clamps. Uh, I use wedges and stick it, like if I need to reach in deeply into a guitar or something or a mandolin or whatever, I can, you know, then put wedges in between here and use this as a clamp. There's quite a bit of pressure there. You can put quite a bit of pressure on something even though this is really extended. Now this one's not a real strong one admittedly, but this one would be as you can see and, and I have them in different sizes and shapes and, you know, I use them quite often depending on what kind of a repair job or whatever it is I'm doing. Just over here in the corner, kind of a cluttered area, but I have some more little molds. You know, I, these holes here, this I can clamp this down to the table top with a clamp, and then these here I can clamp to the neck, and the peg head would go here, and this is what I can use to support a mandolin to do a fret job. 
So, and then I put leather here and leather here, whatever I need, you know, to uh, space it out and hold it really firm so that when I'm tapping new frets in, it's really held very solidly. Same way with this, that's more or less what that's for too. And then I have other little specially made pieces, like when you're trying to clamp a round body, you can put this up against the round body and maybe clamp across these square flat edges. So it just helps sometimes to square things up and be able to use clamps better. That's all that's for is just to be able to use clamps a little bit better. So I just saved them. I don't know that I'll ever use them again. I may or may not. They may end up in the furnace. You just never know. Here's a specialty tool I use with my disc sander. And I'll see if you can guess what it would be for. It's a radius tool. So I can put a deer antler saddle in here for the mandolin and go across here like so and it'll cut a 12 inch radius. And the radius is just dependent upon where you have these holes. This I have it in the 12 inch distance here so that's a 12 inch radius. A 24 inch diameter. I also have one marked at 14 inches and 15 inches. I could always mark one at 10 or you know 11, whatever I need them at, but right now the 12 is pretty much the standard, so that's pretty much where I keep it. The little sled here has a little backer board so that it won't slide off. I can hold it there with my finger. You just barely have enough room to hold it, and you just cut across there like so. Then I flip it over and cut it back across so that it's equal on both sides just to make sure. But it really works well. Very simple design, but you have to have a way to, to make things accurately, and that helps me. And of course, you've seen my thickness sander that I made. This is just a shroud that fits over this to collect the dust. That's all it's for. I just drilled a hole in here and stuck the end of a vacuum in it. That's really all it amounts to. Nothing fancy at all. And it works really good to suck the dust off. <clears throat> you really have to have a dust collector on this type of deal. I guarantee you, it just kills you with the dust if you don't have it. Then this table, all this was, this right across here, and I do have a video out there somewhere on how, to, how I built this, although I don't think the video goes into great detail, but it does show me building this on the lathe. This was just a long piece of pipe here, and the pipe was double the length of that at least, probably a little longer than that. And what I did was I just sawed the pipe in half, and I put male threads on one side and internal female threads on the other side. And then you just screw them together. And that's all that this is, that's the principle. These are eight threads per inch. And so one full turn is one eighth of an inch or 120 thousandths. So when you just bump it like that, you're getting a couple of thousandths. So you can, you know, you can really be very accurate with this just because of the way it's built. This is just a tightening down uh, mechanism to keep it from spinning. And I just got a pillow blocks here for bearings. This was just a piece of aluminum pipe that I turned very accurately on the lathe and put uh, um, aluminum, I believe I put aluminum centers in there, I can't remember now. But anyway, I, you know, I just have a shaft more or less going through there. Big pulleys over here and a motor down there driving the pulleys. And, you know, it's a 1700 RPM motor so that it's not spinning real fast and then I have it even geared down more so that it's not spinning quite so fast. It's, I don't even know what it's spinning at, but I'm guessing it's spinning at about 800 revolutions per minute. Probably not even that much. 500 probably. That's about it on it. It's really fairly simple design. It works really well. I mean, I can't even tell you how well that is. It's my best shop machine ever. I mean, even including the ones I buy, I use this thing all the time. And I keep a pair of digital calipers here, and these were provided by one of my wonderful viewers, as a matter of fact. I keep a pair of digital calipers right here, and I, you know, measure everything in thousands of inches that come off of here. By the way, for really small things, and especially when the, the shield is on here, it takes up so much space. So when the the dust collection shields on here, you can't get your fingers in there very easily. 
it, you know, and on little tiny parts sometimes, you need to get in there and push it on through. So I make all kinds of little specialty pusher sticks, like this little notch here. I can put, you know, like a saddle, a guitar saddle or something in, in that, squeeze it in that notch and then push it on through and pull it out the back side. So I make all kinds of specialty little push sticks for this, depending on what the shape is that I'm trying to push through there. Keeps your fingers out of the way and gives it a, a constant pressure then all the way through the sander. Back to uh, guitar building. You can see up here I have a couple of guitar molds up on the top. I don't really use those anymore. What they were used for, you can see the blocks on the one on the right, you can, in those, those uh, eyelets, you can take a set of sides, boil them in hot water, put them on there, and then pull them down to the mold with those long blocks that go across there. I don't really use that anymore since I built my better side bender, and we'll show you that next. This is another one of my absolute favorite tools that I've built. This is my side bender. It has the large area here for bending guitar and mandolin sides, then a smaller area here for bending the tight bends in a mandolin, and then a very small area if you just need to bend something really tiny. And there's a heating element that goes up through there that I bought from McMaster Car. It connected up to this Ink Bird, I guess you'd call it a high-tech thermostat, more or less. It's a little different than most thermostats that just turn on and off. This kind of keeps this at a constant temperature, much better. I'm gonna go ahead and unplug it. I don't really wanna heat this up right now because I just don't need it hot, but it's already warm. And uh, anyway, you know, you can see on here that the printout, you can set the temperature on the bottom gauge and then it will just continually rise and then hold it at whatever that temperature is. The the method I've been using is just spritzing the sides with water, putting them on here, using this to spread the stress out. In other words, instead of pulling on the wood, I pull on this, and that spreads the stress out, and you hardly ever break a piece that way. This is for mandolin sides. This is for guitar sides. This has changed my side making so dramatically that it's impossible to explain to someone who's not doing this all the time. It used to take me hours and hours to make a set of sides. I can make a set of sides now on a mandolin in under 30 minutes, assuming this is already up to temperature. And this only takes about 10 minutes to get up to temperature, something like that, maybe less than that even. But it really works well. I absolutely love this thing. I don't think you can buy one any better than this. I like this table format. I mean, I know they put them in vices, turn them sideways and all that, but the table format keeps everything square. You know, all your, your sides are perfectly square. Like, you can bend them at a slight angle and not even realize it. Plus, the wood itself has its own ten, uh, bending tendencies, and it will want to bend sometimes at a slight angle. So putting it on the table keeps everything nice and square. I really like that also. I have several drill press fixtures, and this one I'll show first. This one is for drilling to a certain thickness on a top. For instance, or a back, that is. You center your drill bit over the top of this nail. You clamp this down. Then you set your stop. This has a stop on it so that it will only go to a certain, like if I wanted it to stop right there, now that it won't go any further down than right there. So I, I can keep this distance constant right here. And then on a, and the reason you use that little single point rather than the whole table is that on a curved top or a curved back, you know, that little, you can, you know, you can be very accurate for the distance between here and here. And it uh, works really good. I, it's a method I only started using in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, I Actually, I think I've done something similar to this before, many times actually, but uh, for building, for actually hand carving the instruments, this just turned out to be a very quick way and a very easy way to ensure a certain thickness. And, and, and that's not even really near my final thickness, but it gets me close, and then I just do the rest by hand with my little finger planes. 
So that's a pretty handy little rig. This little jig is very similar in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. You put your deer antler saddle in here and you need to drill the two holes uh, through down into the saddle and you can set your depth on your drill press put this underneath here, drill your hole, and so that, you, like I don't like my holes to go all the way through my saddle, so I just stop it just before it gets through the saddle. And so this, this keeps the holes exactly the same all the time on the deer antler saddles. And this is another similar uh, tool. Now I didn't make this. This was given to me by a customer and I believe it was the Regal Rec episode. That customer gave this to me, very handy. This is for drilling the uh, bridge pin holes in a new bridge. And uh, you know, more or less you can tell how that works. You just, it just keeps the holes in a certain space. And then these two little alignment pins, once you drill your first hole, you put in a pin, and then you drill your other hole, you put in a pin, and then you can drill the other ones and you can be assured that it won't move on you. Very handy. I guess I should back up and say that this is also one of my most used shop made tools. This is how I make the deer antler saddles. The pattern is over here, you would put the piece of deer antler here, and there's a little stopper right here that when you turn this into the stop, it, you know, it can't go any further, and then it, that makes the pattern on your, on your bandsaw blade right here. Um, you just, so more or less, it just follows the contour of this pattern and puts it over here on the deer antler. And of course you have to have the holes drilled first in order to put it on here. So you use that tool I just showed you for getting the hole spacing right. Now, this is actually another pattern. This is a left-handed pattern and this is a right-handed pattern. The left, the, uh, the normal or the, the standard right-handed pattern is made out of ebony. My left-handed pattern is made out of rosewood and that way I don't get them confused. Ron uses this a lot. Ron comes in and makes the deer antler saddles for me now. But this is a very, very handy tool right here. It's designed on the old concept of making keys. And in fact, that's what gave me the idea. When I saw someone making keys one day in the hardware store, I said, that's how I need to make my deer antler saddles. So this is what I came up with. While we're at the uh, bandsaw, this you've seen me use too. This is just for cutting the neck V block into the neck of an instrument. And you can, you know, this just tilts at the right angle and you can lay your body on here, slide it in and cut one way, slide it in here and cut the other way. It's just a helpful little sled. And I believe I got this from the original Rob, Roger Simonoff book. As I, as you've seen me do, I don't use the dovetail on my mandolins. I just use a straight joint and then put dowel pins in it. It will never come out. You can't get a neck out of a mandolin anyway like you can a guitar. I mean, it's possible, don't get me wrong, but you know, in the nearly 40 years I've been doing this, I've never needed to take the neck out of a mandolin. So it's just not that important to make it a dovetail, in my opinion. Here's another little tool I made in the shop. It's just on rollers. It keeps all the scrap plywood in one place. And you know, I have lots of scrap plywood all the time. And I, you know, I made this little pocket to keep the little pieces in and then the bigger pieces can go in the bigger area here in between. There's another pocket on this side. This side is the thinner pieces of plywood. On this side, it's the thicker pieces. And then in the middle, it's anything that's longer than would fit in these pockets. So it works really nice. It's just easy to move around. Holds quite a bit of wood, actually. It's not great for the big four by eight sheets, but hopefully you're not really storing those in your shop. You're usually cutting those up and then you have scraps left over. Got a tabletop full of other little fixtures and things. You've seen this little plastic jig that I use. I, I mostly use this for gluing the binding on uh, instruments. So I put the fretboard in here and then I can wedge it up against the sides and uh, glue the binding on. It really works well for that. That's what I use it for primarily. This is a Stumac bought uh, drill guide for drilling the uh, tuner holes in the uh, F5 style peg head. I modified it first. I didn't like the way it was made. And then I um, made my own. And I like this one even better. This is what I use. And this is, I made, I made this, don't get me wrong, with this. 
but uh, so the holes are very accurate. I can clamp this down to the peg head and know that I've got it lined up really well and, it, and then I can drill both sides at once and it's just very handy. This is a fixture for gluing the blocks, the corner blocks into a violin and then gluing the sides to the corner blocks. So that's what that's for. This system you've seen many times. This is my routing jig for routing the slots and bridges on guitars. And this is just the opposite side so that the, you know, I put this around near the sound hole side and, you know, it's got these little deals on it so that cutouts where it'll go over the pick guard, that kind of thing. So that way I have a, a base to slide the router on. So, and then, you know, if, I, if I'm into a tight spot, I have a smaller base there that I can use too. So anyway, that's what that is. It's just homemade. You can see how it's made there with the bolts going through. They can slide in the slot there and then you can tighten them down right here. So this can be adjustable. You just clamp this to the top of the guitar and then that way, you know, line up your uh, router bit and cut it with this angle. Works really, really well. This is a neck pulling jig for a guitar that I, uh, I kind of modified and made. I believe it may have been Chuck that sent me part of this. I think all I kept of it, the original, was this and maybe the bolts. <laughs> but anyway, um, you can the, the fretboard slides into here. This pulls up on the heel of the neck of the guitar and uh, it lifts the heel right up out of the dovetail slot. So it's really a very, very handy little tool. This is my little jig that I got from uh, this first Semenoff book. And I, I can lay my mandolin on here, the neck facing down, and get the, you know, when I'm gluing the neck on the mandolin, this, by the, by the top laying in this and the neck laying on here, then I know the top is gonna be at the right height so that when I put the bridge on it, it won't be too tall or too short. So this is just an, a neck angle setting jig is really what it amounts to for, a, for an F-style mandolin. This cutout is where the scroll fits for the, uh, when you turn the mandolin down, the scroll is laying in there. Very simple little jig, but it works really good, keeps it, everything at the right angle. These are just a few calls that I made for when I glue bridges in under guitars. These go on the inside of the guitar, so when I'm gluing the bridge on, this has, gives me something to clamp against. Of course, I've got a ton of patterns, and this is just a few. This is the neck uh, pattern, so I get the right angle on the uh, F-style mandolin. This is just a fretboard pattern, and you know, if you're making a right-handed mandolin, you want this on the top. You want this facing up, in other words. This would be a left-handed mandolin if you turn it the other way. This is a, a peg head pattern that I took right off of the 24 Lloyd Lore. And this is a Martin D28 pattern that I took off of a guitar from a deceased friend. Uh, his name was uh, John Henry. I was friends with his uh, mother and father, Gene and Walt Henry. They wanted me to repair his guitar. This was after he had passed away. And so I thought all my future uh, Dreadnought guitars will be made on that pattern. And, uh, you know, just because it was his guitar. I'm sure it's just like every other Dreadnought, don't get me wrong, but it was just the, the point of the fact that I took it right off of his guitar. Here's just a bit of bonus footage. If you can tell what this is, it's a crossbow. This is something that I made when I was 18 years old. It's got a little tiny peep sight right here that you can look through, a real tiny hole. So you put it up here like this and you're looking through that little peep hole and it's very tiny, I will tell you for sure. So a lot of people can't even see through the hole, it's that small. So, you know, you get up here and you, where you can see through the hole and then you put this pin on, then the sights here, you just move up and down and uh, you put the little pin on what you want to hit. You know, you have to know your distance, of course, at 20 yards, for instance. And uh, then you just squeeze the trigger and everything's homemade on it. The trigger's homemade, everything. And it, the trigger locks in and lets go of the string. If you can see it here, the, you know, the, the string gets looped around that trigger, like where my thumb is, and then you pull the trigger and it slides right off. So here's the loop on the string right here. 
that hangs onto the trigger. You lay your arrow, you lay your arrow on this little piece of plastic right here, and of course your back of your arrow is on your string, of course. But uh, you know, and it's not much to look at. It's it's actually made out of walnut, and it's uh, you, you can rest your elbow down here on your side, lay this on your hand like this. It's only about a 35 pound crossbow. It's not very strong, but is it ever accurate? I, you know, it, it sounds like I'm bragging. I used to be into archery a lot and I was a very good shot. I, I was Missouri state champion intermediate level when I was only 16, I think it was, or maybe 15. But anyway, you know, I went on to be a very good archer. I used to shoot with a lot of the professional archers. So, I mean, I know what good shooting is. And trust me, with this little baby here, I could, at, at, uh, tw at 20 yards, which is 60 feet, I could hit a, uh, a quarter every shot. And I mean like every shot. And you would think, oh, come on, you'd miss. No, I'm serious. Like every shot, I could hit a quarter. And my uncle didn't believe me, as a matter of fact. So he says, all right, I'll put a quarter up there. And every time you hit it, it's yours. Every time you miss it, it's, you know, you owe me a quarter. And I said, all right. So he had a, he had a few quarters in his pocket. I don't know, three or four or five, whatever. He puts them up there. I shoot every one of them. So I made that, you know, keep in mind, this is back in the early 80s, guys. Uh, maybe even before that, now that I think about it. And anyway, uh, you know, I hit all the quarters. Well, then he says, all right, I don't have any more quarters. Here's a nickel. So he puts a nickel up there. And keep in mind, this is 60 feet away. <laughs> it's hard to see a nickel. Shot, first shot, hit it, you know. <laughs> he goes, okay, here's a dime. And he puts a dime up there. I said, forget it. I ain't shooting it. I can't even see that. <laughs> so anyway, it's that accurate. It really is an, an accurate little crossbow. Just thought I'd throw that in. That didn't cost you any extra.